Thank you all so much for the invitation. Um, it's really nice to be with you today and um, nice to have uh, so many friends and uh, people that I uh, ad admire a lot as colleagues in the audience. Uh, I'm grateful to and privileged to join you today from unceded Coast Salish territory, the ancestral homes of the Musqueam, Squamish, tsleil and Coquitlam First Nations. Today in Canada is a new national holiday, the National Day for Truth and Reconciliation. This is a day to remember the harms imposed on Indigenous children and communities by the Indian residential school system that existed in Canada for many decades and harmed thousands and thousands of children in their communities. The last residential school in Canada closed in 1996, just 25 years ago. This summer, First Nation communities uh, across Canada discovered hundreds of bodies buried at multiple former residential school locations. These were children who were killed through neglect and abuse, whose families were never told what happened to them. Of course, these discoveries have been very difficult for Indigenous peoples across Canada. I'd like to ask you to please join me for a moment and pausing to grieve for the horrific treatment that Indigenous people around the world have faced from colonization and to commit ourselves to work for justice and reconciliation in our own lives. Thank you. Uh, the work that I'm talking about today has been done in collaboration with many others. My students, Hadar, Annika, Caroline, John, and Scott, as well as my former postdoc, Josh Wright. Um, I also wanna thank Nisha, my six-year-old son, for helping with the slides. The lightning bolts and stars are his additions. As you know, we're in a climate emergency. Even with current policies that are in place, we're on track to raise temperatures by <clears throat> at least three degrees by the end of the century. Um, if we assume that countries actually follow through on their pledges and targets that they've announced, we're still on track to raise temperatures by about two and a half degrees. Two and a half degrees would be disastrous for human civilization and most life on the planet. Even the one degree Celsius of warming that we've already caused is creating serious problems across every part of the world, including drought, fires, floods, food shortages, more powerful hurricanes, and intense heat extremes. In British Columbia, where I am this summer, more than 300 people died because of a record-breaking heat wave. The science has been clear for a long time, uh, but humans have been slow to act thanks in large part to powerful institutions and individuals who want to maintain a status quo that benefits them at the expense of other people and the health of the planet. Just this month, 20 leading medical and health journals published a joint statement on climate change and said the greatest threat to global public health is the continued failure of world leaders to keep the global temperature rise below 1.5 degrees Celsius. And they went on to say, urgent society-wide changes must be made and will lead to a fairer and healthier world. The IPCC tells us that we have a very short window of opportunity. We might be able to keep warming to 1.5 degrees if we act now and reduce greenhouse emissions to net zero by around 2060. To accomplish this would require unprecedented changes including technological changes, but also behavioral and cultural changes and other kinds of change. And it would require global cooperation, the likes of which the world has never seen. This is a tall order, but we need to make it happen. Over the last few years, I've been trying to understand the social psychology of climate change, and it should come to no surprise to those who know me, I've been working from the perspective of the social identity approach. Social identity and self-categorization theories would both suggest that whether people work to protect the environment depends on their identification with groups whose identities are consistent with environmental protection. In my own work, I've focused on identification with environmental activists, um, and there's many other studies looking at how our identities shape responses to climate change. But that is not what I wanna to talk to you about today. 
Rather, I want to focus on some of the other assumptions within social identity theory, which of course was not just developed as a theory of groups per se, but as a theory of intergroup relations with particular attention on when members of disadvantaged groups will work to challenge their social position and demand social change. So social identity theory suggests we can't just look at group identities, but we also need to consider people's subjective understandings of the social structure. So that includes the permeability of group boundaries and the focus of the talk today, the insecurity of intergroup relations. According to social identity theory, people are more likely to resist their low status and work for social change the more that they see intergroup relations as insecure, meaning that they see intergroup relations as illegitimate, unstable, and the more that they have access to cognitive alternatives to the status quo. Um, and cognitive alternatives to the status quo uh, are uh, people's awareness of the alternatives to the current state of intergroup relations that from their point of view or their group's point of view are subjectively plausible and positive. Riker and Haslam argue that insecurity is characterized by the fact that individuals are aware of cognitive alternatives to the status quo and hence can envision specific ways in which it could be changed. Despite this theoretical importance, the insecurity of group relations has been examined almost entirely in terms of legitimacy and stability. And only a few studies have empirically examined cognitive alternatives. For example, Zhang and colleagues found that being made aware of a better future for a disadvantaged group can increase collective identification with that group. Um, and the power of cognitive alternatives to catalyze collective efforts at social change was demonstrated quite well in the BBC prison study in which Riker and Haslam created a mock prison with participants assigned to be prisoners or guards. At one point, the experimenters introduced a new prisoner who had a background in trade union organizing. As the experimenters intended, the new prisoner quickly developed cognitive alternatives to the status quo and shared these ideas with other prisoners. The subsequent actions of the prisoners led to a new formal process for negotiation with the guards and the eventual breakdown of the prisoner guard hierarchy, which was replaced by a commune where former prisoners and guards were now members of the same group. I hope I got that all right, Alex. Uh, the BBC prison study also demonstrates how cognitive alternatives are relevant to high status groups. In the BBC prison study, being able to imagine cognitive alternatives to the prisoner guard hierarchy not only motivated the prisoners to resist their low status, but it also motivated the guard to agree to give up their high status. When a high status group is tainted by illegitimacy, as the guards in the BBC prison study were, high status group members might be willing to relinquish their status if cognitive alternatives present a set of social relations in which they can shed or transform their current identity in favor of one that is subjectively more positive. So we've brought this into the environmental context and have considered environmental cognitive alternatives or cognitive alternatives to the environmental status quo which we define as access to ideas about what the world might be like if the relationship between humans and the natural world were harmonious and sustainable. And although we've defined this uh, in terms of the relationship between humans and the rest of nature, which of course we have to define it in terms of a relationship because that's what cognitive alternatives are about, uh, they can include and implicate other intergroup relationships as well. So between environmentalists and fossil fuel companies or citizens and elites or youth and boomers. Now we started this, our work in this area by creating the Environmental Cognitive Alternative Scale or ECAS. Now, let me just say really clearly before going any further, the scale is not the thing that we're interested in. It's a tool for testing hypotheses. It's a way of bringing an important concept into the literature. Uh, the scale should not be taken to mean that we think of cognitive alternatives as some relatively stable individual difference variable. That's not what we're trying to do. So where did we start? Uh, measuring cognitive alternatives is not totally straightforward. And the way we decided to do it 
is to more or less ask people to self-report whether they have access to cognitive alternatives to the environmental status quo using items like these. It's easy to imagine a world where we no longer use fossil fuels. When I imagine an ecologically sustainable existence for humans uh, or what an ecologically sustainable existence for humans would be like, I can picture it in detail. A harmonious relationship between humans and the natural world is easy for me to imagine. If people are curious, I can show um, all 10 items in this scale uh, later on. So in our first three studies, uh, as we developed and tested this scale, uh, we found that scores on the ECAS measure uh, do predict identification with environmental activists using kind of a standard uh, social identity measure. Uh, it also predicts pro-environmental activist intentions, uh, interest in joining environmental groups or going to protest or demonstrations. Uh, one of our items was even about engaging in civil disobedience. Um, and these relationships uh, are robust to the inclusion of a bunch of different control variables that we've, we've looked at. In our third of these studies, we gave participants a chance to write a letter to the Minister of the Environment of Canada, uh, urging them to strengthen climate policy. And we found that ECAS scores predicted writing the letter. It also pre uh, predicted the number of characters that people wrote. Um, and in addition, um, and as we expected, this relationship was largely mediated by identification with environmental activists. Okay, so we've got uh, several studies uh, showing correlational relationships. Um, in study four, we set out to manipulate environmental cognitive alternatives to test for causal effects on activist identity and activist behavior. Uh, before going any further, I want to say, yes, of course, the reverse is likely to. And that is an interesting uh, relationship as well, that engaging environmental activism can also potentially be a source of cognitive alternatives. So I'm not trying to argue against that causal direction. That's just not the causal direction that we're looking at uh, today. So what did we do? Um, we ran a study with about 600 uh, US participants. The sample looks, um, this was through prolific. They look pretty typical for a, a sample from prolific or MTurk. Um, and participants were randomly assigned to one of two conditions. Uh, and in the control condition, people just completed the dependent measures, some of which I'll show you in a minute. Uh, in the experimental condition, however, participants read, humans do not currently have a sustainable relationship with the rest of the natural world. Human actions have wreaked havoc on the Earth's ecosystems, including the warming of the planet and resulting climat climatic changes. Now, please think about a world different from the current state of our own, where humans have a more harmonious and sustainable relationship with the rest of the natural environment. Please take two to three minutes to write your responses below. Think specifically about three questions. What would that world be like? How would it be different from the current world? How might society operate differently? So our thinking here is that uh, one way to elevate environmental cognitive alternatives for people is just to get people to think about it for a while, that most people probably have some access to cognitive alternatives. Um, and if even if people don't, they might be able to generate some thinking about it a little bit. Um, and so that's, that's what we, we tried. And what do we find? Um, well, in terms of our, what is our manipulation check here, environmental kind of alternatives, we found a significant effect. So those in the writing condition scored higher on that ECAS measure than those in the control. Um, even more interesting, we saw a significant effect on identification with environmental activists and a significant effect on uh, intentions to engage in activist behavior with those scores being higher in the experimental condition than in the control. Um, so we were quite ex excited by this uh, manipulation that works uh, on our, our measure, um, but also has some causal effects on these other important variables. And to investigate whether or not it was really cognitive alternatives and not something else that we unintentionally manipulated, um, 
that's causing the effects on activist ID and activist behavior, we ran some mediational analyses. And we found that for activist ID, environmental cognitive alternatives mediates the relationship between experimental condition and activist ID. And similarly, we found uh, mediation um, when we're looking at activist behavior. So this gives us some um, additional confidence that what we really are doing is manipulating cognitive alternatives. And that's what's responsible for the effects on uh, identification and um, activist behavioral intentions. Okay, we did some kind of exploratory tests for generalizability just to see like how well this manipulation worked. Uh, across uh, different participant characteristics. So here we're testing for interactions between condition and different participant characteristics. Just We're looking just at what's predicting the cognitive alternatives measure, um, not, not the, the other uh, DVs. So we found no moderation by political orientation, um, no moderation by ethnicity, although we had we did that in a fairly crude way, just comparing racialized minorities versus uh, others. Um, and we found no moderation by perceptions of environmental threat. There was a hint of an interaction with gender, not significant, um, with a slightly smaller effect for men, um, but still a significant effect for men. Um, interestingly, we did find significant moderation by age. Um, and you might just make a prediction uh, right now before I show you the slide. Think about, is it, does it work better for younger people or for older people? Well, it turns out it works better for older people. Um, so bigger effects among older participants um, and above, or sorry, below age 29 or so, we're not seeing any uh, significant effects of condition. So we didn't expect this. We could only speculate uh, about why we found it. Um, and we're curious to see if it replicates in future studies. Um, in practical terms, however, it's maybe a good thing that we found something that works for older folks um, who tend to be less supportive of environmental activism and climate change mitigating policies compared to younger people. Okay. Um, so these results are exciting for us. I hope they're exciting for you. But cognitive alternatives are more than just a number on a scale. Uh, they contain ideas and content. And so we wonder, you know, what is it that people imagine when they're thinking about what a sustainable world is like? So we looked at this question first in a secondary analysis uh, from some of our previous uh, studies um, with Oh, over 600 participants who were asked, can you imagine a world different from the current state of our own in which humans have har a harmonious and sustainable relationship with the rest of the natural environment? So this was one question that was embedded within a larger um, uh, questionnaire. And if people said yes, which uh, I don't remember the exact numbers right now, but over 90% did say yes. So it was less than 10% that said that they couldn't think of any um, an environmental cognitive alternative. People that who said yes, we asked them to describe what that world would be like and how would that world be different from the world we live in now. And so we got lots and lots of uh, data from uh, these participants uh, that we coded for the presence of different kinds of content. Um, here's, we've got more categories that we coded for than, than this, but this, these are some of the things that were mentioned by at least 25% of participants. And I'm gonna not talk about all these, but just talk about the four most common. So a lot of people write about a lack of pollution. Um, they're in really sort of talking about what the state of the environment is. They talk about clear skies, they talk about clean waters. Uh, a lot of people write about uh, treating other animals with more respect, um, including uh, a lot of people writing about uh, more people being vegetarian or everybody being vegetarian in this uh, sustainable world. Uh, people also wrote about a move away from fossil fuels to other forms of energy, which, which makes, makes sense in this context. But what I want to emphasize today is that they also mentioned human relations, changes to the way that humans relate to other humans in ways that don't have any clear direct connection with the natural world. Um, 
And I think this is pretty interesting considering that we ask people to describe a world in which people have a sustainable relationship with nature. And in part, what they wrote about was how humans will relate to other humans differently. And it seems that at some level, people have a implicit or, um, or implicitly see a connection between how humans treat other humans and how humans treat uh, the natural world. So just to give you some examples of what people said when writing about human relations, people would be kinder and gentler. People would work together there for the good of all the people. I think overall, people would have a greater sense of humility and respect towards others in addition to the environment. Workers around the world would have rights. The world would not run on capitalism, but rather on social equity. So I think these are very kind of interesting responses for people to give when you ask them to describe what a sustainable relationship between humans and the natural world would look like. I mean, you have somebody talking to us about workers' rights, um, which, you know, it doesn't, I mean, I can generate a connection, but there's not an obvious connection between that and how humans are treating the natural world. So I think that's quite exciting that um, so many participants, probably about 40% of our participants do mention something about human relations that doesn't have a director connection with, uh, with the environment. So we explored this a little bit uh, more deeply um, in a study that used some 30 minute uh, semi-structured interviews with 11 self-identified environmental activist students and 11 non-activist undergraduate students. Um, and they were first asked to describe from their point of view, the state of the natural environment. And then we started with questions asking them, can you imagine a world where we've managed to successfully mitigate climate change and other environmental problems? And if so, what is that world like? Uh, the uh, inter interviewers also uh, would probe uh, when people ran out of uh, things to talk about, to ask about specific areas of, of human life and how those things might be different. Um, let's see, um, so what did we find? Uh, we did a thematic analysis of these qualitative uh, transcripts and we found some common themes across both the activist group and the non-activist group. So these are very common themes that almost everybody writes something about. Renewable energy, uh, moving away from fossil fuels, electrification, a lot of people writing about electric vehicles. Reduced consumption and reduced materialism are also mentioned quite frequently. And increased connection to nature. Um, and of course, people do mention some changes in human relationships as well. What's really interesting to me here is the comparisons between the activist sample and the non-activist sample. The activists were more likely to provide more detail, complexity, and nuance. They were describing things that were more different from the status quo than what the non-activist sample uh, was describing. They articulated connections between different issues, including and especially between sustainability and social justice. So I want to show you now a few uh, quotes, uh, all from the activist participants, because they really help illustrate what the activists were doing differently. Um, I think the complexity that we see and the nuance that we see, the connections that we see activists making are um, a sign of the richness of their cognitive alternatives, um, which I think is why, you know, and it makes sense that we find these in the activist sample. Um, these are the kinds of complex and detailed cognitive alternatives that we might think might, might drive people to activism the most. And the reverse is also likely too, that people that are involved in activism have a chance to learn from other activists um, and they come up with more complex and sophisticated ideas about how we could do things differently. Okay, so 
pretty much everybody talks about transitioning to alternative energy, but here's Activist 11 doing so with a little bit more nuance than what we would see from the non-activist participants. So whether that is solar or wind or nuclear or tidal power or hydroelectric depends a lot on the local characteristics of the environment near you. So here this, this participant is saying, well, what the cognitive alternative looks like is going to vary depending on your specific location, which I think is pretty interesting. And we didn't hear that kind of thing very often from uh, non-activists. Um, similarly, um, we had many uh, participants saying things that were about technology. Pretty much everybody talked about technological changes, um, especially uh, electrification and moving to the new energy sources. But the activists were more likely to express technological skepticism. So they would say that technology was important, but not, not the thing that's gonna solve everything. Um, so activist one says the great climate transition, there has to be a huge technology component to that. But I do not think technology is what will save people. I think it is connection and uh, consumption and reducing consumption. Um, so not only do we see some skepticism about technology here, but we also see some interesting kind of implicit connections that someone is drawing between our ability to connect with one another as humans and how that might also relate to our uh, consumption uh, and our consumption patterns as well. So moving on, uh, we see that the activist sample is much more likely to make explicit connections between sustainability and human social relations when talking about environmental cognitive alternatives. Activist one says, you cannot properly address climate change without addressing like social inequity on the planet. Activist two says, I feel like we would change the way we relate to our environment um, and we would change the way that we relate to each other. I feel like those would kind of go hand in hand. So this was a common kind of uh, idea expressed among the activist uh, sample, but there were a couple of, of folks in the activist sample who were expressing, in a sense, the opposite point of view um, and arguing that we needed to separate climate from other kind of social justice issues. So, um, to give you an example of one of those two, Activist 9 says, at the climate march, we started to chant like, yeah, climate justice and all things. Then they started to chant migrant rights and I stopped. It is like, yeah, I get it. It's a very important question, but like stop, because what you are doing then, you are making a question of politics again. That should not be the thing. We should have we should uh, have socialists and conservatives and liberals and every whatever. Everyone should be focusing on this together. So I think this is interesting first because it's important to uh, attend to the heterogeneity that we find um, uh, between uh, participants uh, and between activists. Um, but also because this, I think, reflects a, a broad two broader narratives that exist among. Uh, people who are concerned about climate change. Um, a climate justice narrative that says that we have to address inequity and justice as we mitigate and adapt to climate change. Um, and even uh, more strongly than that, uh, making a claim that, that we can't really address climate change without addressing inequality. And that often has a focus on economic power that spills over into political power. On the other hand, you have other people promoting a climate purist narrative, basically saying that these social justice issues are separate from climate change and that trying to connect them is only going to alienate some people that we might meet on side. Um, oh, anyway, I think that we're, it's interesting seeing, seeing that difference. Um, well, you know, that exists um, more generally. I mean, I could, I could name a few different authors that, that have these different points of view in writing about climate change, but seeing that in their participants as well, um, and thinking, you know, that there might be some important differences in terms of the consequences of these two versions of the future, two different ways of thinking about sustainability in the future. Okay, 
Uh, to summarize, uh, it seems like being able to imagine a sustainable world does predict environmental activism. And we now have some evidence for a causal effect and um, we'll be hopefully getting some more very soon. Um, in social identity terms, I think you can say that you know, we've got some additional evidence that cognitive alternatives do increase social competition. Uh, quite interestingly, we found that changes to human relations are a part of what many people imagine when they think about what a sustainable world would be like. Um, and in fact, uh, that's one of the things that we want to look at the most uh, um, closely in our uh, future research. How does the content of these uh, cognitive alternatives matter? In particular, uh, how the presence of uh, content about justice and equality, how that might change uh, the consequences of environmental cognitive alternatives. Related to that, we're also interested in how different collective identities might alter the appraisals of environmental cognitive alternatives, in particular appraisals with or without justice. And there we're interested in identities like partisan identities, race and ethnicity, social class, country or region, um, with the idea that um, especially the cognitive alternatives that include justice, that they may have some very different implications for people that have different uh, social standing. Um, and that having justice be a part of one's uh, vision of a sustainable world might draw in many people who feel like they are disadvantaged within the existing system and might alienate those who feel rel relatively privileged and powerful within the existing uh, system. And we're also interested in application and thinking about ways that we can scale up um, interventions that might increase people's cognitive alternatives uh, thinking about uh, the environment uh, as a way of getting more people on board, uh, getting more people engaged in trying to address climate change. All right, thank you.